What you do in chapter 4 is pretty much this, forces. You're going to discuss about forces and you are going to go over the laws of Newton. So let's go into it step by step. What is a force? You must already watch the videos, yes. Any push or pull? Push or pull of one object on another object. That is a force. So force simply means push or pull of one object on another object. Okay? Pushing or pulling of one object on another object. Now pushing is a force that can be, can be applied on a solid object. You can't push a liquid. You can't push a, a cable, a rope. I can't push a, a rope. I can't push a liquid. I can only push a solid, like that, okay? So solid, I apply the push on the table. But I can't just connect a rope and push the rope. So pull is what happens on a rope and a chain and stuff like that. So if you're tying a rope and holding, you know the tie ropes, when you're tying something down, what kind of force is actually inside is a pulling force, stretching force. You're trying to stretch something. That's a pulling force. So, the push or pull, push can be only applied on a solid object. Pull can be applied on solid as well. I can, I can pull this. I can pull a chain and rope and other things, but you can't actually pull, uh, push a chain and a rope. So what can forces do? That's the next point. What can forces do? You are applying a force. What can forces do? Yeah. Accelerate an object, change direction, deform an object, transfer energy, and cause rotation. Cause rotation. So one by one, a simple term that we can actually say immediately, oh, you're applying a force. What can happen? The object will move, obviously. See, that's it. So if I'm applying a force on this, the object is moving. So a simple term is moving and if you expand on that so an object which is not moving you can make it move an object which is already moving you can make it stop or you can change its velocity right you can change its speed like you can make it go faster or slower so if something is already moving you can slow it down by applying a force if something is already moving you can speed it up by applying a force And if something is moving, you can just change its direction by applying a force. Only change its direction. Like imagine a soccer ball is coming from there at a certain speed. And you just deflect it. When you deflect it, the soccer ball is still moving at the same speed, but changed its direction. The direction has changed, but everything else is fine. The speed did not change. So you can apply a force and change the speed or change the direction and in short it can change the velocity because velocity is combining both magnitude and direction. so if magnitude or direction or both change that means basically it is change of velocity and when something is changing in velocity you can use one word to substitute for all that change of velocity what is it Acceleration. So in other words, when you apply a force, you can accelerate an object. So you can write all those points down. Uh, I don't know if all the points are actually on the video, but write it down. If you don't have it, write it down. So it can move an object, slow an object, make it go faster, change the direction of the object. In short, change the velocity of an object. In short, accelerate an object. Okay? So an object can be made to accelerate by the application of a force. Is that clear? What else can the force do? It can cause deformation. It can cause deformation. You can apply a force on a rubberized object and it will change its shape. Now the change of shape can be two types. One is a temporary change of shape. Temporary deformation. 
and the other one is a permanent deformation. Permanent deformation is like yours, you're breaking it. When you break something, that is actually permanent deformation. Tempor this is a temporary deformation. See, the shape is not a rectangular block anymore. Right, Mike? I don't have to say this many times. All right, so this is a change of shape, but only temporary. I release the force and it's back. But if I do it a little too, far, too much, it will break it. I don't want to try that here, but it will break it and that will be a permanent deformation. So forces can do that. Make a temporary deformation or a permanent deformation. A soccer ball, when you push a soccer ball, the soccer, the soccer ball actually will, you know, dent, which means it's actually changing its shape. But that's only temporary. Now, if you actually apply a strong force and dent it a lot, it can just puncture the whole thing. And that means you're permanently deforming, permanently damaging it. What are the other things? Cause? Transfer energy. A transfer energy, yes. A force is very responsible for transferring energy. And we will see it in the chapter of energy, chapter 5. Okay? So when you talk about energies, we will learn about that part of it. Uh, a force is also responsible for creating pressure when you push an object you're creating pressure on the object that creation of pressure requires a force as well so what can a force do to an object it can apply pressure right? when someone is forcing you to do something it creates a pressure right? technically yes when someone is forcing you to do this task right? this is the time limit Finish it. You know, you're pressurized. Not in the real physical term, but yes, in a different way. So, pressure is created by a force. A force can cause rotation. Like, think of a steering wheel. Are you applying a force on a steering wheel? You are applying a force on the steering wheel. So, are you moving the steering wheel? Literally, you're not moving the st steering wheel. is still there. You're not like pushing the steering wheel and giving it to somebody behind the car. You are actually, still the steering wheel is intact in the same place. All you are doing with that force is just to give it a little spin. So by applying a force, you are making, uh, you are causing rotation. Let me know if you have any ideas. All right, anything else that forces can do? It can do a lot of things. That's why I said, about pressure, we will learn it in the right section. About energy, we will learn that forces are going to be everywhere. Forces are going to be everywhere. Right now, what is creating the pressure that I'm experiencing in this room is because of the force of impact of all the molecules and atoms in this room on me. They're coming and hitting me, and that's causing the pressure. So we will learn all these aspects at different times, but force is a very important term. Okay? And um, moving from there to first law. What is basically the idea of first law of Newton? So Newton's first law, yeah. Um, every object will stay in the same state of motion and is acted, acted on by unbalanced external forces. That's right. So you're taking the notes right. So every, any object will stay in the same state of motion. Now when you say same state of motion, a state of motion could be at rest. Or it could be something that's moving at a constant velocity, right? So if a marker is kept here on the table, the marker is at rest now. The marker is at rest. So what's the state of motion? It is moving with zero velocity. So a marker is not moving, which means it's moving with zero velocity. Or if I move the marker like that, see, it's moving at a constant velocity. That's also a different state of motion. So, when, uh, again, read that statement. Um, every object will stay in the same state of motion unless acted on by unbalanced external forces. Unbalanced external forces. Those are pretty important. Unbalanced means like they are not cancelling off. They're not cancelling off. So those are the forces. So, if I'm keeping this marker right there, what are the forces acting on the marker right now? So if I'm keeping the marker on the table, what are the forces acting on the marker? It's weighted. One is the gravitational force, which we'll discuss in a, while, in a moment. This is the weight. 
which is the gravitational <coughs> force caused by the Earth. What's the other force? The table pushing it up. The table pushing it up, we call it contact force, or we'll also call it normal reaction. It is a contact force from the table on to the object. The word normal in math means what? In geometry, what does normal mean? Perpendicular. This is a perpendicular force from the surface. So, whichever way the surface is, if there's a contact on the surface, the surface will apply a force on the object in a perpendicular fashion. Look at the board. Am I pushing the board right now? When I'm pushing the board like that, the board is pushing me which way? Just like that. The board is pushing me perpendicular to the board surface. It's not pushing me along my hands like that. It's pushing this way. So the contact force is always perpendicular. And that's why it's called normal reaction. Why is it called reaction? Because this is the actual action that initiates that contact. It's because of the weight acting on the object, the object is trying to sit and press on the table. So it causes a reaction, which is the push from the table on the object. Now, are these two balanced? They're balanced forces. They're balanced forces, and that means it should stay in the same state of motion. If they're balanced forces, it should stay in the same state of motion. If they are unbalanced, that's when things are going to be different. All right, the first law is clear. You can also state the first law this way. In the absence of external unbalanced forces, now the word external, what does that mean? External means from the outside. So this is an outside force. The, the marker is acted on by gravity of the earth is pulling it. So this is an external force. This contact force is coming from the table onto the object, right? So that's an external force. Now, is there a force inside the marker internally? Yeah, there are a lot of, see, look, look, what is holding this cap? It's so tight. Isn't that an internal force? But the internal force won't do anything to the object. It is the external force that actually makes a difference. Yeah. So, um, like the whole external thing, mm -hmm. say you're inside a car, mm -hmm. and like, you're like, kind of like jumping around or whatever. Mm -hmm. And the car like shakes. Couldn't it technically it move because you're inside and moving it? Uh, it's it is not really moving it. You cannot just move it. It is just basically uh, as you said, because you are abruptly going and stopping at one side. It is actually trying to. Uh, that's why we're coming to inertia. Uh, we'll come to that. So inertia kind of deals with that. But you can't just. Like, you can't sit inside the car and push the dashboard and make the car go forward. That's what I mean. You pushing the dashboard is an internal force that will not do anything to the car. So whatever is happening inside the car won't make a difference. Right? Logan? Yeah. yeah. So whatever you do inside the car is not going to make a difference. Whatever is going to happen from the outside is what we call as external forces. So in the absence of unbalanced external forces, right, that means it's balanced. In the absence of unbalanced external forces, the object will stay in the same state of motion, which means if it's at rest, it will stay at rest. If it's moving, it will continue to move with constant velocity. If something is moving with constant velocity, you can see it. Now, here's a marker that is moving. Here's a marker that's moving at 10 meters per second. How many forces are acting on this marker now? How many forces are acting on the marker? Which ones? Gravity. The gravitational force, which is the weight. The contact force of the table. The contact force, the normal reaction from here, yes. And? Well, I mean, it, what an external, an external force was acting on it. It's not right no, I'm just giving a situation. Here's a marker that's moving at 10 meters per second. How many forces are acting on it is my question. 
it's just the same too. Now, if you're bringing in other forces such as friction or whatever, then uh, things are going to be different because then you can't have this moving by itself at 10 meters per second if there is friction. So ignoring friction, there is nothing else. These are the only two. So if a marker is moving at a constant velocity, you have still the same two forces and they are balanced. And that's why it is moving at a constant velocity. Now, Newton's first law and the third law, they are pretty conceptual. But if you fail to understand it, you can actually be, that can impact your problem solving completely. It is very conceptual, so don't take it very easy. Because some of the conclusions that you make while solving a problem numerically will be like, oh, according to Newton's first law, this is what it is. According to the third law, this is what it is. Okay? So you understand about unbalanced forces, external forces? An object will stay in the same state of motion, and that is pretty much what we uh, refer to as inertia. What is inertia? Inertia is a tendency of an object to stay in the same state of motion. Tendency of an object to stay in the same state of motion, that is inertia. <clears throat> so if an object is already at rest, it wants to stay at rest. If an object is already moving, it wants to continue moving. Right? And that is basically the inertia. So I think I gave some examples. If I throw a ping pong ball towards you, or if I throw a bowling ball towards you, which one will be easier to stop? The ping pong ball is easier to stop because it has less inertia, so you can change that state easily because it has less inertia. The bowling ball has more inertia, therefore the tendency of that bowling ball to keep going is going to be, is going to be greater. That's why the bowling ball has more inertia. You have to stand. Take your book in your hands. Yes. So, I gave you that example. Any other examples? I gave you in terms of the tendency of an object to stay in the same state of motion. Yes. Stop yeah. Stop. yeah, exactly. A truck a truck has more tendency to keep moving, and therefore it is not easy for a truck to stop so quickly, just like your car. So if a truck is actually behind you, you should be extremely careful, because you may be able to stop in that distance, but the truck won't be able to stop. So the moment you notice there's a truck behind you, it will be a wise decision to keep going because most probably the truck also will just follow you because they can't apply and if they, even if they try to apply the brakes they may cross the line and then stop but what if your car is standing there it's definitely going to cause problems so yeah inertia causes that any other example mm -hmm. uh, one you gave was like a smaller boy versus a bigger boy and uh, you tell a bigger boy to move over a seat, oh, yeah. he's going to like complain and say you have to use more That's board. right, yes. So a bigger boy, a fat, op, fat boy, a fat student and a skinny student, if I ask everybody to shuffle and move around, the fat one will actually hesitate to move because he'll say, oh, why? Should I really do it? You know, that sort of thing. Whereas a skinny person has no problems at all. He just spring up from a seat and go wherever. Because he has less inertia, it is easy to move in, right? And that's why in football, the players are expected to be kind of heavy. Because the weight of the person, the heaviness of the person, the inertia of the person makes a big difference. Because if you're holding the ball and running, it is difficult to stop you. It is difficult to stop you. You can't actually like stop someone really heavy. So. Imagine you have a sumo wrestler sort of figure playing football. You just pass the ball to him, he just kind of walks through the middle. <laughs> People are trying to stop him, but he can't grab him because his arms are pretty big as it is. So it is difficult to stop him, and he keeps walking. Touchdown. <laughs> so what I'm saying is, bigger objects, I mean, heavier objects have more inertia, lighter objects. Then you can see the consequences in many places, like in your car. 
one of the reasons why you're using a seat belt is because you have inertia. You have a tendency to keep going. So if you're driving a car at 60 miles per hour, remember your car is moving at 60 miles per hour and you are also moving at 60 miles per hour. And God forbid, if something happens and you crash into a tree or something like that, the car is made to come to a halt because the tree stopped it. Who's going to stop you? Nobody's going to stop you. So you'll just fly through the windshield. You'll just fly because you're going at 60 miles per hour. Nothing is going to stop you from diving forward. So to prevent that accident, you need somebody to stop you. So the belt. So the belt will hold you in place and kind of stop you. It may even fracture some of the bones, but still you'll be fine. Better than going and hitting the tree at 60 miles per hour. Okay? So inertia, you can see all that. So imagine there's a bus and you're standing in the bus. You're not holding anywhere. And the bus is going fine. The driver applies brakes on the bus. So the bus comes to a, or reduces the speed. The bus is reducing its speed because the driver applied brakes on the bus. So the bus is brought to a slower speed and you're standing straight. You were traveling with the speed of the bus. Who applied brakes on you? Nobody. You are an independent object. So as soon as the bus driver applies brakes, what will happen to you? You'll start running forward. You'll be going to the front of the bus. If you don't hold anywhere to, ref to uh, prevent yourself from moving, that's what happens. The same with the bus taking off. You're standing like that and then the bus suddenly kind of starts moving forward. You fall backward because your body wants to stay where it was. Your body wants to stay at rest. That's your inertia. So the tendency of that object to stay at rest or to move depends on mass. So when you're driving a car, you can just imagine two scenarios. Imagine you are just keeping a file folder on the seat. A file folder on a seat. Okay? And think of a water bottle on the seat. You have a water bottle on the seat and a file folder on the seat. You hit the brakes. Which one has a tendency to stay there on the seat and which one has a tendency to like roll, roll off? The water bottle is definitely going to go because it's got inertia. It wants to keep moving with that speed. You applied brakes on the car. Your seat belt is slowing you down. But the file folder has less inertia. It can easily slow down itself by the grip on the seat. Whereas the water bottle is kind of having inertia and there's nothing to stop it easily. And so the water bottle goes off. So heavier objects will slide off. Lighter objects will. So, say in the bus again, you are standing like that and a little kid is standing down there. When the bus driver applies brakes, the kid won't be affected much. The heavier person is going to be affected much. All right? I think I gave an example also of a, of a skinny person and a, and a sumo wrestler coming down a hill. Yeah. All those examples will actually tell you the inertia concept. So, if... See this, the marker is sitting on the paper. And now, since the marker has inertia, are you able to see it? Since the marker is sitting on paper, look what I'm doing to the paper. I just pulled the paper out and the marker is still sitting there. Didn't realize that the floor went off. Right? That is inertia. The marker is staying in the same state of motion. It wants to do that because it has inertia. That's why when I pulled it, the marker stayed exactly there. Okay? Whereas if I pull it gently, then I'm giving enough time for the marker to establish the contact and understand that the floor is moving. But if something moves like quickly, something moves quickly like that, it will stay in the same state of motion. This is that right. All right, so inertia is a concept that needs to be thought of. And inertia comes in the first law. So what is inertia? Inertia is mass measured in kilograms. So the heavier the object, the more the inertia. The heavier the object, more inertia and so on. All right. So that is basically what the first law is talking about. And then, did I go to the third law? Let's go to the third law. All right. Let's go to the third law. 
why I'm discussing the third law and the first law. Third law of Newton. Again, first law and the third law are very conceptual, and that's why we're discussing that first. And then we'll go to the second law where we will bring in numbers. Okay? And the second law is more of quantitative stuff. And the first law and the third law are more qualitative. Okay? But it is very important to understand the first and the third law in order to work through second law properly. So don't forget that. So what is this third law of Newton? This is a, a law that almost everybody knows it. And everyone, if they want to boast that they know some physics, will quote the third law, saying, yeah, I've done physics. I know this. Third law is something that they remember. But the law is not properly understood by many. Now you're going to understand it. The third law. You all know that for every action. That is what it is. For every action. You just say for every action and everyone knows how to complete it. For every action there's an equal and opposite reaction. And But people uh, refer to that in different contexts. Like you keep hitting him, you will get it back sometime. You know, for every action, retaliation is going to be sometime. That is not the third law. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. It doesn't mean that. What actually it means in physics is what we're going to focus on. So, the first point that you have to understand over here in for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction is this, that forces always come in pairs. Write it down. Forces come in pairs. Forces always come in pairs. What does that mean? That means you cannot create a single force into existence. Impossible. You can't just produce one force and say, well, that's the only force. No. If you produce one force, there must be a pair somewhere. Forces come in pairs. They always come in twos. And try to understand that concept. So, forces always come in pairs. You cannot just point out to a force and say, yeah, that's a single force. Single forces don't exist. Single forces don't exist. They always come in pairs. Okay? But the pairs have to have some uh, qualifications to be called pairs, some, some characteristics. Let's say, for example, I am. Uh, this is a book that is sitting on a table. How many forces are there? Yeah, one is the weight. We will learn later on what about weight, and this is the normal reaction, the contact force. So I'm pointing out two forces. And suppose I ask you, what is the pair for this force? Gravitation. It's often you know, easy to kind of make a mistake here. That's why I'm pointing out this. I said forces come in pairs, right? So let's say, look at a practical situation. Imagine you're walking to a park, and you see a bench. And on the bench, there's a male and female. Pay attention to the example. Okay? There's a bench, and on the bench, there's a male and female. And I'm just asking this question. Who's the wife of that male? What will be your response? Will you just say the female? How can we be so sure about it? How can you be so sure that the female is the wife of the male? I only said male and female. I didn't say anything else. What if the male was a 95-year-old man and the female was a two-year-old girl? Will you stay with the conclusion? <laughs> no? I'm not talking about things that are happening in different parts of the countries or things that are uh, immoral. Okay, I'm talking about things that are morally correct. So I'm not going to think about anything else. All right. So technically, what are, what is the one characteristic that should be nearly true uh, for a husband and wife? They must be of the same, Indeed. approximately at least. 
So they must be same age. Same age. In terms of forces, they must be same forces, magnitude-wise. Do you get it? Now, now I say, all right, fine. They are of the same age. Now, is that female the wife of the male? You didn't say anything. You just said. Huh? It could be. Again, now, now you have more doubts about whatever I'm asking, right? So, is the female the husband of the male? Again, if you say possibly yes, or uh, yes. Now let me explain the situation further. The male is a 25-year-old man. The female is a 25-year-old female turtle, or whatever. It's an animal. Now will you <laughs> will you still say yes? Yeah, well, no. Again, I'm talking about what is morally correct. Okay, so I'm not taking anything, anything further. I'm not talking about these days. What was considered to be correct earlier and what is still to be, you know, considered to be properly moral is what I'm talking about. So, is that a possibility? No. So, what is the other characteristic that must be true if they are to be called husband and wife? Same type. In other words, same species. If one is a dog, the other must be a dog. If one is a man, the other must be a man. So it should be, no, I mean like, <laughs> if one is human, the other must be human. Okay. If one is human, the other must be human. So they must be belonging to the same species, which means same kind. Look at these forces. What kind of force is this? It's a gravitational force. That's a type of force. What is this force? It's a contact force, nothing to do with gravity. They are totally different kinds of forces, so they can never be pairs. They can never be pairs. What is? What are some of the other characteristics that must be true for those two to be pairs? They must be opposites in gender. Again, don't look at present day. <laughs> Okay, they must be opposite, so they must be almost same age. They must be uh, opposite in uh, gender. They must be of the same kind. At least these three are very important. And of course, there are other things as well. So let me list all those things down. So what are the characteristics of third law pairs? Characteristics of third law pairs. Number one, equal. In magnitude, like they must be of the same age. Okay. Two, opposite in direction, like opposite in gender. Look at these two. Is this same magnitude? Yeah. Opposite. Yeah. So these two are true. But the third one takes it off. Same kind of force. So if one force is electrically uh, produced, the other one to the electric laws. If one is magnetic, the other must be magnetic. You can't have one force is electrical and the other force is magnetic and call them pairs. Um, so if that doesn't work... Well, we'll find out. We'll find out who the real husband wives are. Is it like we'll get there. We'll find out. They are not pairs anyway. <laughs> we'll see. The fourth characteristic is this, that they must act at the same time. They must act at the same time. In other words, if they are pairs, they must come into existence at the same time. It's like saying they must have got married at the same time. Right? Husband and wife. Husband cannot say, no, she got married five years back. I got. So if they're husband and wife, they have to be married at the same time. So act at the same time. Which means that, now, are these two acting at the same time? Yes. Think about it. No. Weight is always going to be there. The contact force came in only because this book was trying to press on the table. So if I toss the book up like that, the weight is still there, but is there a contact force? 
So they, they are not coming together. These two are totally not going to exist together. This exists because of the contact. But this exists because the earth is pulling it. And the earth is going to pull it always. So act at the same time. Um, act along the same line of action. The line of action should be acting along the same line of action, which means like this. If one force is like that, the next one should be along the same line. You can't have one force here and the other force here. See, a force here and a force here, they are equal, they are opposites, right? They may be of the same kind, but they are not acting along the same line. If they're not acting along the same line, they're not pairs. Simple. So acting along the same line means like along the same. So in terms of family, even though they're opposites, they must be pushing the family along the same line, right? Both must be working towards the growth of family. Okay. Sixth one. They must act on different objects. They must be acting on different objects if they have to be called pairs. They must be acting on different objects. The weight is acting on which object here? And the contact force is acting on which object? So then definitely this is act. If they are really pairs, they must be acting on different objects, not on the same object. So if all these conditions are checked, then you can call them pairs. So as he was asking me, so where, where exactly is the pair for the weight? If this, is, if this is not the real wife of this, then where is it? Must be sitting somewhere in the home, right? So I'm taking this off. So to find out the pairs is very easy. It's very easy to figure out the pairs. What you have to do is this. <coughs> Write this further down. What is weight? It's a gravitational force, right? On what? <laughs> On both. By what? <laughs> By what? <laughs> what is applying this force? <laughs> what? What is pulling? The earth. The earth. It's a gravitational force on the book by the earth. Now, according to these conditions, should the other pair be also gravitational? Mm -hmm. yes. And should they be acting on different objects? Yes. So simply flip these things. Flip these and you're good when you find the pair. What is it? It's a gravitational force on the earth by the... So if this is the earth, not to scale. <laughs> if that's the earth, not to scale. <laughs> the, this is the earth which is being pulled by the book. So the book is being pulled this way, the earth is being pulled that way. So this is the gravitational force on earth by book. That is a pair. Yeah, on earth, by the way. You get it? Now let's go to the checklist. Are these two equal? No. But no. Well, I mean, like, They're both the same. How are they, they, how are they equal though? They're equal. <laughs> what is the but since earth is much bigger, isn't its gravitational pull much stronger than the no, 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 no. So, first of all, let's let's learn about what is this gravitational pull. What is gravity? What is gravity? Gravity is the force between any two masses. The force between any two masses is gravitational force. So, is that a force between Michael and uh, Jackson? Yes. Yeah. Attraction. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> such a, gravitational forces are always attraction. Okay. It 
it is gravity it is a gravitational force between them and how do I calculate that gravitational force pretty easy to find the gravitational force I need their masses so what is a gravitational force it's a force between any two masses if this mass is m1 and this mass is m2 there is a gravitational force between them and the force between them are exactly the same no matter what okay doesn't matter what it's the same force so let's say if Mike Tyson punches me on my face, I can just laugh it off. You know why? Because my face applied the same force on his hands. <laughs> it's the same force, no matter what. It is going to be the same force. You cannot apply a larger force than what you're going to get back. So if I'm going to hold this tissue paper like this, if I'm going to hold the tissue paper like that, can you punch this tissue paper with a force larger than what the tissue paper is going to apply on you? Impossible. You cannot punch this with a larger force than what this can apply on you. It's always equal. Yeah, it's a lot of concepts here, but you know, you should understand all these concepts together. And the force between these two, this is the equation for it. It is a constant times m1, m2 over the d squared. d is the distance between the centers, center to center. And what is capital G? Capital G is called the universal gravitational constant. It's a constant throughout the universe, and its number is 6.67, 10 power minus 11. This is a constant, which will be given in your data sheets and all that. 6.67 10 power minus 11. So with this, you should be actually able to find out the force between two. So let's find it out. Let's find out the force. And remember, these are two equal forces. They cannot be unequal. It doesn't matter what the masses are. They're going to be equal. So what is your mass? It's about 220 pounds. 220 pounds. To get it in kilograms, divide by 2.2, .2, which is 100 kilograms. Okay. So you are 100 kilograms because we need SI units. What's yours, Michael? What? What's yours? 110? Oh, my weight? It's like 125. Okay. I wish I can, Mike, I can shrink that way. Anyway, 125 divided by 2.2. .2, that will get you the mass. So I'm going to do the calculation. 6.67, 10 power minus 11 times M1 which is 100 kilograms times M2, which is a 125 divided by 2.2, .2, how much is that? Well, you, to convert pounds to kilograms divided by 2.2. .2. How much is it? 56 oh, divided by D squared. What is D? So let me measure the distance between them. Can I do this? Can I do from here to here? No. No. Center to center. So it should be from the center of him to center of him. So I'm just going to measure it. Approximately, yeah. approximately it's 150, 100, 110. So 110 centimeters, which is 1.1 meters. So you put 1.1 meters square. Can you tell me the force? Calculate it right away. Calculate it. So gravitational force is the force between any two masses. It can be between you and the earth. It can be you and your friend. Now. 3.09. That's a very small force for them to really get pulled in. We'll continue this.